Hello everyone, Michael here. This is part 3 of my OpenLab series. In part 2, we talked about the steady state lab time simulation algorithm and created a very simple lab time simulator in Excel. Today, we're going to talk about the vehicle model and go through the vehicle file creation. Now, I know this video is long, so I suggest you download the code and follow along and feel free to pause it and rewatch parts whenever you need to. Also, in the description, I have links with some suggestions for books that go through many of these concepts in more depth. So let's start by creating a vehicle file. Open vehicle reads the declared Excel file that looks something like this. On GitHub, you will find an empty file for a new vehicle creation. You will have one Excel file for each vehicle you create. On the info sheet, this light blue column is where you input your values. As you can see, everything is categorized. You start by naming the vehicle, then you input the mass, the weight distribution, and so on. When you get to the ratios, keep in mind that you can fill in the values for the ratios, and when you are done, leave the rest of the cells blank. The code will automatically discard empty cells. If you want more than 10 gears, just extend the table. Now, on the torque curve sheet, you input your values and whenever you need more space, you just fill the table downwards. The code will automatically extend the table. Now, going back to MATLAB, you type your file's name in the file name variable and run the script. This creates a .mat file that includes all the vehicle's info and that is needed for open drag and open lap. The code reads the Excel file and creates one table for each sheet. Then it goes through and saves each value from the table to the corresponding variable. The reason I have i equals i plus 1 after each line is so that you can add variables and reorder them without having to change the row index. Then it updates the command window and goes through the model generation. Now let's talk about the model itself. First of all, all the axes follow the right hand rule convention with x being forward, y left and z up. Theta is positive when in a downhill, phi is positive in a right hand favor and bank turn, and omega is positive in a left turn. Now, the forces are calculated via these formulas. We have the normal to the ground weight component, with the cosine of both banking and inclination effectively cancelling out the angle sign for reasonable values. Now, because weight points downwards, I have a minus sign up front. I obviously use positive values for the gravitational acceleration and the mass, so that's why this is true. The X component of the weight must be positive when on a downhill, helping acceleration. So with a positive theta, we are good. The Y component, though, needs to be positive in a left-hand favoring turn. So with a positive phi, we need a minus sign in the front to fix that. For downforce and drag, I use the usual formulas with CL and CD being multiplied with factors if you want to play with scaling. If not, just put one in all of the factors. Now drag needs to be negative always, so the CD value should be negative. In terms of CL, you need a negative value to get downforce and a positive value to get lift. Also, as the vehicle itself and its speed vector is always parallel to the ground, we do not need to include inclination and banking in the aero forces. The total normal force is the sum of the weight and the aero forces. For the normal force on the driven tires, we use the weight and aero distribution and the number of driven wheels to determine its value for each one of them. Rolling resistance is multiplied by the absolute value of the normal force, so the coefficient of rolling resistance CR needs to be negative as well, to show that in a sense it is a drag component. Now let's talk about the tire model. There is no slip angle, camber pressure or temperature sensitivity as I wanted to keep things simple. So I only included the influence of the normal load on the tire's friction coefficient. This normal load sensitivity is assumed to be linear. As you can see, the formula is tire force equals friction coefficient times normal load, with the friction coefficient changing linearly with normal load. So the delta mi over delta f shows the linear slope of the sensitivity and the n0 value is the normal load in newtons where the total friction coefficient is equal to mi0. In the longitudinal acceleration case, I use the value for the normal load on the driven tires and in the deceleration case, I use all the tires. The lateral case is the same as the deceleration case, 
Again, for simplicity, I have not included the effect of weight and error distribution on the friction coefficient. To help you understand what I mean by that, let's think about the very rear weight and aero biased vehicle. Then, because the rear normal load is higher than the front, and it also increases with downforce, the drop of the friction coefficient for the rear tires is larger than the front. So it's not the same as taking one quarter of the total normal force and using that to calculate one unified friction coefficient, as the rear should have a different one than the fronts. Also note that the tires are assumed to be the same on all four corners. If you want, you can easily include different values and variables in the Excel file and modify the code to have different rear and front tires. But keep in mind that if you want to start including effects like this, maybe an upgrade to the bicycle model is something to consider. In terms of combined force generation, I use the friction ellipse. This means that the proportion of the longitudinal and the lateral forces to their maximum values, squared and then summed, need to be equal to 1. For the equations of motion, Newton's second law is our friend when connecting forces and accelerations. Also, the accelerations between the nodes are assumed to be constant. Speed is the integral of the acceleration, and distance is the integral of the speed. And for whenever the vehicle is cornering, we use the equation of circular motion to calculate the lateral acceleration. Now, the assumption that the vehicle accelerates with a constant acceleration between the nodes helps us eliminate the time variable and create the distance solver. If we rearrange the velocity equation, we can substitute the dt variable into the distance equation. Then we substitute dx as a track mesh size. Then we expand the result. This way, we get an expression that connects the distance step, the initial and final velocity, and the constant acceleration. This is what the distance solver uses to calculate the speed at the next node, and is the same exact one I used in part 2, where I showed you how to create a simple lap time simulator in Excel. Now to the brakes. First of all, this channel is only a driven channel. This means that it is not used to calculate anything in the deceleration sequence. The idea is that you find the maximum deceleration that the vehicle can achieve, and then just look at what value of brake pressure and brake pedal force creates this deceleration. The brake system is assumed to have a 50% brake bias setting and the same master cylinders for front and the rear brake systems. Also, all the calipers are the same. So to calculate braking pressure, we multiply the braking force of one tire, which is assumed to be one quarter of the total braking force, with the ratio of the tire radius over the disc radius, which is reduced by half the pad height. This is the brake disc friction force, so to get the normal force on the pads, we divide by the pad friction coefficient, and to make that a pressure, we divide it again with the total caliper piston area. This is parameter Vita, and brake pressure is Vita times tire braking force. To get brake pedal force, we calculate the master cylinder piston force by multiplying brake pressure by the master cylinder area. Then we double it due to the 50% brake bias assumption and finally divided by the brake pedal lever ratio. This gives us parameter phi. This means that we can now simply use two numbers, vita and phi, and calculate brake pressure and brake pedal force. Let's now look at the code. As you can see, it just includes the equations displayed on the right for the braking system and calculates the parameters vita and phi. In terms of steering, the steering angle channel is again a driven channel. This means that it does not drive any calculations inside open lap. Also, for simplicity, the induced drag of the steered wheels and the vehicle's slip angle are not modeled and the angles are assumed to be small. As you can see in the picture, I use the bicycle model to calculate the steering angle. The wheelbase and the weight distribution provide us with a longitudinal center of mass position and the A and B lengths. For the lateral forces and yaw moments, we use these equations, keeping, keeping in mind the following. First, the units of the angles depend on the way you define the cornering stiffness of the tires. Secondly, we have two tires in the front and two in the rear, and that is why everything is doubled. This also means that when you set up your vehicle Excel file, the number you need to input for the cornering stiffness corresponds to a single tire and not both of them. Thirdly, the front slip angle is the summation of the steering angle and the vehicle slip angle. Now, we need to produce enough lateral force to combat the lateral acceleration and the banking induced weight.
and we need to produce zero yaw moment for pure circular motion in the quasi-static methods that OpenLab uses. This gives us two equations with two unknowns, meaning that we can now write the problem in a matrix form. This matrix is created and saved here in the code. Finally, to get the steering wheel angle, we need to multiply delta with a steering rack system ratio, which is defined as the steering wheel angle over the steered angle, which is usually a number higher than one. And now onto the powertrain. I have included a primary gear ratio connecting the crankshaft and the gearbox input shaft, gearbox ratios that connect the input shaft to the output shaft, and a final gear ratio acting either as a chain sprocket final drive or a differential final drive. These are the equations that connect the wheel and the engine in terms of speed and torque. Keep in mind that the torque needs to be multiplied by the gear meshing efficiency N to simulate transmission losses. Also, the speed units are in RPM because of the way we define the torque curve in the vehicle Excel file. Moreover, there is no change of inertia modeled when changing gears. The wheel speed in meter per second is then calculated from the wheel RPM via the multiplication with a tie radius and 2 pi over 60. The engine tractive force is the wheel torque over the tie radius. And to get fuel consumption, we first calculate the work generated by the engine tractive force by multiplying it with a throttle position sensor value and integrating it over distance. Then we divide it by the gear transmission and thermal efficiencies to get actual engine work. And then we divide it again by the lower heating value of the fuel we use to get the actual fuel mass consumption. Now in the code, the integral is actually modeled as the cumulative sum of all the instantaneous fuel consumption values. For the driver throttle and brake inputs, we assume linear relationships between input and output. This means that during acceleration, the throttle position sensor value is what can or should the vehicle give us over what can the engine give us. This creates three cases. First is the vehicle is power limited, so go full throttle. Second is the vehicle is grip limited, so we need to lift the throttle pedal to not spin the wheels. And third is if the vehicle has enough grip and power to overshoot the next point, so we need to modulate the throttle. All this is modeled via the minimum function, and we can use either forces or accelerations. It's the same thing. Now, as I said before, we assume a linear relationship between throttle input and power delivery. If you want to include effects like the sigmoid function for a naturally aspirated butterfly or any other response curve for a forced induction engine map, this is where you should do it. This should be done by figuring out this ratio first and then doing an interpolation of the reverse function for the map. Obviously, the braking input during acceleration is zero. When braking, throttle is zero and the brake pressure is calculated via the VITA parameter in the braking model. We obviously always want to see values that are between zero and one for the throttle and just positive values for the brake pressure. Now that we have talked about the powertrain equations, let's optimize the engine tractive force for maximum acceleration and calculate all the shift points. First, we get the engine speed and torque curves from the tables and then we calculate the power curve. Now we pre-allocate in memory three matrices, one for the wheel rotation speed, one for the vehicle speed, and one for the wheel torque. They have equal number of rows as the torque curve table, and as many columns as there are gears. Here we go through the gears and fill in the table for each column. Now we get the minimum and maximum speed allowed by the max and min engine speeds in the defined torque curve and gear ratios. Maximum speed should be when the engine hits the last RPM value in the torque curve, i.e. The, the RPM limiter, for the highest gear, and the minimum speed value is for the first RPM value in the torque curve for the lowest gear. Now we create a new speed vector from the minimum speed up to the maximum speed. This is so for each velocity value that the vehicle is allowed by the engine to achieve, we can now calculate the best gear and engine tractive force. In the next line, I pre-allocate matrices for the selected gear and tractive force at each velocity. I also create a larger matrix for the tractive force 
that includes all the gears. This is the matrix that we will use to make our gear selection. The algorithm for this is shown on the right. We need to go through the vehicle speed and for each possible value get the best gear and maximum tractive force. So we get a speed value and go through all the gears. Then what we have to do is back calculate what the engine speed would be. Then with the engine speed known we get from the torque curve what the torque value is and then calculate what the wheel torque is for the selected gear. But we already did this here. So we can just use the wheel torque per gear matrix divided by the tire radius to get the tractive force directly. Note that we interpolate the values in the torque curve and we limit the output whenever the engine speed is outside the bounds by forcing it to be zero. So you get zero force when over the RPM limiter or under the idle RPM. After we have populated the engine tractive force per gear matrix, for that specific vehicle speed, we calculate the maximum engine tractive force for that speed and the best gear is just the column index in that matrix. Now to simulate kind of like a clutch effect, allowing the code to calculate states that correspond to an engine speed value lower than the lowest one included in the torque curve, we just inject zero at the start of the vehicle speed vector and the first gear at, at the start of the gear vector. We also inject the first value of the tractive force vector once again at its start. The final engine speed for each vehicle speed value can now be calculated as the correct gear is now known. The same is true for the wheel torque, the engine torque and the engine power. This means that we now have a full gearing model that correlates the best gear and engine RPM at each value of the vehicle speed as shown in this plot. We can also see the rep drops at each change that give the RPM curve its sawtooth look. The way we calculate the rep drops is shown here in the code. First, we get the indexes of the gear changes in the gear vector. By subtracting every value from the next one in the vector, we get one whenever the previous gear is lower. But now, the gear change vector we have is one size smaller, so we can add a zero in the beginning to fix that. But at the same time, we can add a zero at the end and get a one every time the next gear is higher and fix it again. By doing both and adding together the resulting vectors, we can get another logical vector that has two ones every time there is a gear change that correspond to the indexes of the speed right before and right after the gear change. This way, we can extract the values directly from the engine speed vector and create a table with the rev drops. Obviously, the shift points will be at the odd indexes and the arrive points will be at the even indexes. With the rev drops now known, here I create a table and save the values in a nice format. Let's now look at the resultant tractive force. Here you can see the force generated by the engine in each gear in the dashed lines. Note that for all the speed values before idle and after the limiter, the force is zero, except for the first gear due to the injection we did previously. The maximum force generated by the engine is in solid black. The friction that can be generated by the tires is in solid yellow. The maximum tractive force that the vehicle can produce is in solid red. The aerodynamic drag force is in solid light blue. The point where the final tractive force or the red curve intersects with a solid light blue drag curve is where the vehicle's drag limited speed is. When these intersect, the vehicle cannot hit the engine speed limiter on the straight. It is important to note though that the speed at which this happens is dependent on the inclination of the road surface. For example, a car on a hill climb will have a lower top speed for the same setup compared to a downhill. Let's now say that we have to find out how much throttle we can apply at a specific condition. We are at a specific point on the track, which means that we know the turning radius, the banking and the inclination. We also assume that the vehicle is at a specific speed. This means that we can calculate all the external forces. This includes aerodynamic downforce and drag, rolling resistance, total normal load, driven wheel normal load, longitudinal and lateral induced weight. Knowing the normal loads, we can now calculate the maximum tire forces for pure acceleration and deceleration, as well as pure lateral tire forces.
Then finally, knowing the speed, we can get the engine tractive force by interpolating the tractive force curve. Then we can calculate the lateral acceleration that is being used. All the forces must produce accelerations that are equal to the needed centripetal acceleration. This means that we need to take the induced lateral weight due to banking into account. From that, we can use the friction ellipse to find what longitudinal acceleration is left by the tires. Obviously, if the speed is too high, then the lateral acceleration needed will be higher than the maximum lateral acceleration that the tires can produce. This will create a negative number underneath the square root, which will make complex numbers appear. Finally, we can calculate the throttle value. It's the same thing for braking, with the only difference being that we assume that the driver will always apply the required pressure to generate the braking forces. So we use the Vita and Phi parameters to calculate the braking pressures and forces directly from the maximum deceleration tire force. Also note that we can use either forces or accelerations to evaluate things like the friction ellipse and the TPS value. We just need to remember to multiply or divide things by the total mass. Let's now talk about the GGV map. Well, some of you may ask, what is a GGV map? As I showed in part 2 of the series, if we plot the lateral acceleration of a vehicle on the x-axis and the longitudinal acceleration on the y-axis, then we get something that looks like an ellipse or circle. This happens because real tires can produce both lateral and longitudinal forces at the same time, and it turns out that the combined performance resembles an ellipse a lot. This is why we use the ellipse equation in the first place to model the combined tire force generation. Now, due to downforce and other effects, this ellipse can change its shape a lot. And this brings us back to its relationship with speed, which we add on the z-axis. Now we can plot all the GG circles in every XY plane for every possible speed or Z coordinate. The GGV map is the surface created by all the GG or friction circles for all possible speeds. And its name comes from the GG plot for all values of V, which is velocity. Let's now look closer at each one of the views. We will start with the XY view. This is a generic F1 car. Also note that they have not included drag in these GGV maps. Here we basically see the GG ellipses. We also see differences in the acceleration and deceleration ellipses in the blue and green curves respectively. This exists because of the rear wheel drive configuration, which means that there is more grip from four wheels when braking. The purple region shows the power limited acceleration. And the pure lateral case is where the longitudinal acceleration is zero and is shown in the red dashed line. Looking now at the XZ view, we see the GGV map from behind. Here we see that the lateral acceleration increases with speed. This is due to downforce and the red line that the map follows is a second degree polynomial. But as you can see, there is a reduction in the grip which exists due to the normal load sensitivity of the tires. As the speed increases, the normal load increases due to downforce, and this then decreases the tire's friction coefficient. The final performance curve is the blue curve, which includes all these effects. Now let's look at the side view, which is the YZ view. Here, we see the braking performance that increases with speed. The green curve includes the effects of downforce and tire load sensitivity. The red region shows where the vehicle is grip limited. The blue regions show where the vehicle is power limited. The orange curve has the same shape as the engine tractive force curve. Up to now, there was no drag included in the map. This means that you saw what the car could do with its engine and tires. To get the final result, we need to include drag. When we include drag, what happens is that the complete map gets skewed towards the negative side of the x-axis. This means that a second degree polynomial emerges again and is added on top of everything else. Now is the perfect time to talk about the pure lateral case again. What happens is that the GG ellipse moves around. We can now see that the center of the ellipse is not at the zero zero point. This movement happens due to the following reasons. First, the inclination of the track creates a longitudinal force that can either accelerate or decelerate the vehicle, moving the ellipse center up or down. 
Then the drag that contains both rolling resistance and aerodynamic drag moves the ellipse center downwards. Then we have the induced weight due to banking that can move the ellipse from side to side. With all the external forces accounted for, we can now see the initial positioning of the pure lateral condition shown as the red point. But now this is incorrect. It actually moves to the green point where the longitudinal acceleration is zero. But for that to happen, a force from the vehicle is needed either via the throttle or the brakes. In the case depicted, we need to apply a throttle. And this is because the summation of the drag and the induced longitudinal weight is negative. If it was positive, which happens for example when a car has a low speed on a steep downhill, we would need to apply a negative force via braking. Now let's create the GGV map in the code. To create a generic map for a vehicle, first we assume that there is no constant inclination or banking. Then we calculate the tire coefficients that remain constant. We have tire load sensitivity, the nominal friction coefficient, and the load where the final friction coefficient is equal to the nominal one. And this is both for the lateral and longitudinal cases. Then we calculate the weight on each tire that remains constant. Then we have the induced weight that also remain constant. Then we create a speed vector. Think of it as a slices on the z-axis on which we will calculate gg ellipses. I set a step of 2 meters per second and create a vector from 0 to v max. To make the map look nice, I slice the map at specific angles at each plane. Here I set 4 to 5 points for every half of the ellipse. This means that I will have 2 times 4 to 5 points in a complete GG ellipse minus 1 point that overlaps. Then I pre-allocate the GGV map in memory. Here I will use the GGV variable to create a surface with a surf command. This needs 3 tables, 1 for X, 1 for Y and 1 for Z. This is why I have set the third dimension of the table to 3. These tables need to include the ellipse points in every row. This automatically means that I need to set the first dimension to the number of planes that we will have and the second dimension to the number of points on each GG ellipse. Now I start to loop through the planes or the speed. I start with the external forces which are the aerodynamic downforce, the aerodynamic drag and the rolling resistance. Then we have the normal load on the driven wheels. Then I calculate the acceleration induced by the total drag force and then I calculate the maximum lateral acceleration that the tires can generate. As you can see, it's the maximum lateral force divided by the mass. And we have the same for the longitudinal acceleration case and the longitudinal deceleration case. Then we get the power limited acceleration. As this power limited acceleration is the same no matter what lateral acceleration we have, we convert it to a vector. Then we create the lateral acceleration vector. As you see, I use the cosine to slice the GG ellipse at specific angles and make the map look nice. Now the longitudinal acceleration vector that the tires can produce for each value of the lateral acceleration is calculated from the ellipse equation. Finally, we get the final longitudinal acceleration vector by selecting the minimum values between the tire and the engine vectors. We also get the longitudinal deceleration vector from the ellipse equation. Note that the inclusion of drag is right here where the constant value is added to all the longitudinal vectors. Then we save these vectors in the GGV variable. We save the longitudinal values to the first table, we save the lateral acceleration values in the second table, and we save the same speed value in the third table as a vector. Note that the point that overlaps is the last point from the front half of the ellipse and the first point of the rear half of the ellipse. Also, although I use the same lateral acceleration vector to get both the front and rear halves of the ellipse, I need to include it in the beginning as is for the front half, then remove the same overlapping point and flip the vector for the rear half. To plot the map, I use the following command shown here. You can also play around with some of the settings that I have commented out. Having gone through all this, this is the final graph that we get for the vehicle model. You can see the engine curves on the top left, the gearing model on the mid left, and the traction model on the lower left. You can also see the GGV map on the right. So that's it for today. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below, and I will do my best to answer all of them.
In the next video, we will talk about how we can model and generate a track in OpenTrack and explain its functionality. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.